Are all the students in the back, are you all ninth graders? You know, you could have come to walk with the mayor last Saturday. Four of your colleagues came. They got their hour, they got their hour in that way, walking with the mayor. But keep that in mind if you have to do it again. Well, that seems a little extreme, but... Well, their, their government teacher gave them permission to do that, so... All right, we've got a green light. We're all set now? Yeah, got uh, hooked up, yeah, okay, all right. Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the um, Wednesday. Uh, it is February 19, 2020. It's the meeting of the Adana City Council, and roll call, please, Ms. Allison. Member Fisher. Here. Member Staunton. Here. Member Brindle. Here. Member Anderson. Here. Mayor Hovland. Here. Uh, we say the Pledge of Allegiance at this meeting. If you are so inclined, you may join the council in saying the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> Saying the pledge reminded me of this uh, series they've been running on the History Channel on George Washington. If you haven't seen that, you should take a look at it and talk about a person with uh, dealing with adversity and determination. Um, all right, we have a form of meeting agenda in front of us this evening. Manager Neal, anything you wanted to modify on the agenda or any council member wanted to modify? Nothing from staff, sir. All right. Uh, is there a motion to approve the meeting agenda as shown? So moved. Second. We got a motion and a second to approve the meeting agenda as shown. Any further discussion? All those in favor of adopting the meeting agenda as shown, say aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. And now community comment. Are there uh, any folks in the audience that wish to address the council on a matter of concern to them or make an inquiry on something? I think Ms. Benerot indicated you'd have three minutes uh, to raise a concern on something that's not otherwise on the agenda this evening. If it's on the agenda, we'll cover that later in the public hearing process. So. Um, sometimes we have some folks here that um, are regular visitors, but I don't see any of them here this evening. All right, we'll move on to the next portion of the agenda, which is the manager's response to uh, community comments, which uh, occurred a couple of weeks ago. Manager Neal. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, we did not have any community comment at our previous council meeting, so there isn't a report tonight. All right, very good. Uh, and then we have a consent agenda. We have several items on the consent agenda. Is there anyone on the council that wishes to remove an item from the consent agenda? If not, I'll entertain a motion to adopt the consent agenda as shown. So moved. Second. We had a motion second to adopt the consent agenda as shown. Any further discussion? All those in favor of adopting the consent agenda as shown, say aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. And now we are on to uh, public hearings. Um, and we have several public hearing matters this evening, and Director Teague has the first one, and that is a uh, uh, proposal to, um, uh, with regard to the uh, community development block grant monies that flow through to uh, our city f via Hennepin County from the federal government. So, Director Teague. Yes, thank you, Mayor, members of the council. So this is our 2020 allocation, uh, the city's estimated uh, budget allotment is $136,470, which is the same amount as it was in 2019. Uh, as you're aware, 15% of those funds are used for public services, and all of those are administered through Hennepin County. That was effective as of 2018. You recall the city would do those allocations itself, but those services are now handled by Hennepin County. The remaining 85% uh, is required to be allocated by the City Council, and that's the resolution that's before you this evening. And that is for $116,000. And uh, staff is proposing that you allocate that $116,000 to Homes Within Reach, or uh, part of one of their programs, WALT, West Hennepin Affordable Housing Land Trust. So that would enable them to continue their efforts in buying single family homes and ensuring that they remain affordable for 99 years. Um, in 2019, Walt purchased one home in Edina. 
So their total now, since, since uh, they began this program in 2007, they've purchased 14 homes. Um, so with that, staff is recommending that you adopt the resolution before you that would allocate those funds uh, to Walt. Questions for Director Teague at this point in time? You know, the last time we had um, the West Hennepin County Land Trust in front of us, I think that they had they had, had to wait several years to aggregate enough money to, to purchase a home in Edina. And um, it looks like this would be part of that same sort of uh, strategy that uh, $116,000 isn't going to buy you a lot in Edina. It probably takes uh, three years' worth of CDBG money to be able to purchase a home that needs work. Um, what are your thoughts on, uh, on that? Are you, is staff comfortable with that, that they, that they aggregate funds over time and then, and then buy a home and, and dedicate it to uh, some affordability in, in some way? Uh, yes, staff is. So as, as I noted, they've purchased 14 over the roughly 13 or 14 years that they've been doing this. So th in, on average, it comes out to one a year. Um, the amount that is dedicated to them does cover maybe half the cost of a, a typical affordable home. Um, but we are comfortable with, with this program moving forward for now. The foundation has talked about the possibility of handling these funds themselves, but um, at this point we don't have any program set up. It's something that they would continue to talk about. If, if we were to be providing funds to Walt, and let's say that this money we get to um, 2025 and they still haven't expended this money. I mean, do, it, is it worth thinking about some kind of a clawback strategy where we may want to do something with the foundation if they don't use the money we send to them within a certain period of time and then try to do it ourselves? Is that, is that worth thinking about? Is it, or has that been discussed? I don't believe that's been discussed. They have been pretty, um, I don't believe they've gone longer than two years without being able to, to purchase a home. Okay. Hey, Mr. Mayor, Manager Neal. Uh, one of the things that happens um, when a city uh, goes over the 50,000 uh, population threshold is you, you change your status in, in the CDBG program. And so we will, uh, when, that certi when that new census number is certified, we'll, we will be over 50,000 and we will have a bit more autonomy about CDBG uh, grant dollars than we do today. So we could talk about that sort of clawback and, and control okay. issues then. And we've had a good relationship with them. I mean, if we decided, yes. if our housing foundation decided they wanted to start doing the same thing that Walt is doing and purchasing properties, fixing them up, reselling them, but only selling the house and not the land underneath it to keep it affordable. What I hear you saying is that once the census data gets published, we're over 50,000, we could, we may want to employ a different strategy. And that gives the Housing Foundation time to think about whether they want to be in that right. business too. Okay. That precipitate any other kind of thoughts from council members? Otherwise, this is a public hearing matter. I'm going to open this up for public testimony. If you're interested in uh, inquiring about the recommended use of these funds or uh, you have some other concern, uh, please feel free to come forward. As uh, Director Benaroth said, you'll have three minutes to uh, speak to the council uh, about any concerns that you might have, whether it's uh, pro or con, we can support as well. And uh, I welcome public testimony at this point in time. The hearing is now open. Good evening. Good evening, Mayor, members of the City Council. My name is Hope Melton. I live at 4825 Valley View Road in Edina. Um, I make this statement in support of Resolution 2020-17, approving application for 2020 Urban Hennepin County Community Development Block Grant Program funds, and authorizing execution of a subgrantee agreement with Walt and Homes Within Reach. The city of Edina has a heritage of well-built and affordable, modest, single-family homes. In the face of very high land prices and development pressure, the city has struggled to retain these homes, preserving its socioeconomic diversity. 
This application for CDBG funds will provide $116,000 to the West Hennepin Affordable Housing Land Trust for affordable single family home ownership through the Homes Within Reach program. It offers a limited but important funding source for young families of modest means to live and send their children to school in Edina. While speaking in support of this resolution, I'm aware of the cost inefficiency and outdated nature of trying to address the housing crisis by rehabbing single family homes, especially in Edina. In 2019, Walt closed on one house. Since 2007, the city provided um, over a million dollars in CDBG funding to Walt, enabling the pur uh, purchase, rehab, and resale of 14 Edina homes. That's approximately $99,000 for one dwelling unit over a period of 13 years. When looked at through the lens of our increasingly urgent climate crisis, not maintaining, excuse me, maintaining a very large portion of Edina exclusively for single family homes of any size is not, in my opinion, what we should be doing. If we are to get anywhere close to avoiding climate catastrophe, and there are weekly reports, there's one this evening in the New York Times of its closing in on us, we must provide housing at transit densities throughout the city. This does not mean we create downtown Manhattan, but rather the streetcar neighborhoods of Minneapolis and St. Paul. Nevertheless, in this case, for the sake of young families who desire single family home ownership in Edina, and I have no doubt there's a robust demand, and for the sake of our race, race and equity goals, I support this resolution. Thank you, Ms. Milton. Anyone else wish to testify regarding this matter? Not hearing anything or seeing anyone come forward. Uh, is there a motion to close the public hearing? So moved. Is there a second? Second. We've got a motion and a second to close the public hearing. All those in favor of closing the public hearing on this matter involving resolution 2020-17 say aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. Um, does anyone on the council uh, care to make a motion to adopt resolution 2020-17 for purposes of discussion? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Got a motion second to adopt uh, uh, resolution 2020-17, which would approve the proposed application for the 2020 uh, CDBG uh, program funds and providing them to um, the uh, what, what we call WALT, which is the uh, uh, Hennepin County, West Hennepin County Land Trust. Um, discussion? Anybody have a comment with regard to this motion? No? Everybody's comfortable with this? We're all set. Yeah. It's our, been our process here to at least um, keep some, some uh, affordability in some single family homes as we uh, also develop a multi family strategy. <laughs> so. Um, all those in favor of adopting resolution 2020-17, which would uh, uh, approve the use of those CDBG uh, program funds as described, say aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. And the next public hearing matter is, uh, Ms. Ocker has this matter, and it is a request uh, to approve a site plan modification, uh, 3121 West 69th Street, the uh, so-called York Place Apartments. And Ms. Ocker, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, mayors, member of the city council. This is a site plan modification for 3121 West 69th Street, which is York Place Apartments. It's located south of 69th Street, east of York, and west of Xerxes. It's the apartment building over here on the east side. The original site plan also included the two retail buildings on the site. This uh, plan was actually uh, implemented in 2008, so it's been here for quite some time. 
What the applicant is hoping to do, that it's a 114 unit apartment building. Currently there's a guest suite. They would like to convert the one guest suite into a studio apartment. None of the uh, exterior will change. The site will not change. Parking will not change. Actually, the, the site is currently overparked, so um, parking will be able to accommodate the conversion. The highlighted area here is the location, if you're looking at the east side of the building, of where that um, current guest suite is that they would like to convert into a studio apartment. And that's right here next to the exercise room, again along the east side of the building. The proposal uh, will continue to meet the required standards and ordinances for site plan approval. Um, typically, a planner has the um, ability to make slight modifications to the original site plan. However, the ordinance is very specific if you're going to add any units, even just one. Um, and because this is guest suite, it is not considered a unit. It doesn't have facilities for cooking. Um, that conversion does require review, review by both the Planning Commission and City Council. So this then is that conversion. They'll be putting in a kitchen and then also a washer and dryer in the um, bathroom area. So the conversion will meet um, the site plan requirements. Um, staff is supportive of the plan modification um, and would recommend approval of resolution 2020-22. And with that, I will stop and answer any questions you may have. Any questions, um, council members for Ms. Hawker at this point in time? Member Brindle? Um, I, I, what struck me about this is, um, is this a typical studio apartment in that uh, I don't see a separate space for a bedroom? Most studios or a lot of studios don't have space for a bedroom. Okay. Um, the smallest studio apartment in the building is about, I believe, 548 square feet. This is smaller than that. It's going to be more of a micro studio. So mm -hmm. in terms of affordability, I'm assuming this will probably be the smallest unit and probably the most affordable in the building. OK, thank you. Other questions for Ms. Hawker at this point? Member Fisher. Mine is just sort of a curiosity. Is this, what's driving this? Is it because nobody uses the, the kind of guest unit or is there actually that much demand for another um, what I would assume would be a fairly affordable unit here? Um, I think that's a really good question for the applicant. Um, I, we have found that some of the amenities in these apartments over time may not be very heavily utilized so they look for alternatives. Is the applicant here this evening? All right, thanks, Ms. Hawker. Welcome. Hello, my name is Rick Bialik. I will be the general contractor who is going to be building the unit for the people who own the building. Would you give us your business address, Mr. Bialik? 3024, excuse me, 3025 Harbor Lane North, Suite 410, Plymouth, Minnesota. All right. And uh, could you answer Member Fisher's question? It's a little both. Uh, the guest suite uh, rents on and off during the holidays. It's very easy to rent. Otherwise, it does sit open quite often. And uh, the occupancy is doing very well right now, and they wish to add for the occupancy. Good. Other questions for Mr. Bialik? Anything you want to add, Mr. Bialik? No, sir. Just point. We'll stand by. I'm going to open this up now for public testimony, so if you take a seat, we'll ask if uh, anybody in the audience wants to testify regarding this matter. So the public hearing is now open. If there's anyone who wishes to come forward and inquire about this matter or testify, feel free to do so. I don't see anybody leaping up and hollering, hey, Mayor, I want to testify regarding this matter. Um, is there a motion to close the public hearing? So, so moved. Second. We've got a motion and a second to close the public hearing. A discussion, all those in favor of closing the public hearing, say aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. 
Uh, resolution number 2020-22 uh, would approve a site plan modification to add one dwelling unit at 3121 69th Street West, uh, the so-called York Place Apartments, uh, as <coughs> excuse me, as described by staff. Um, anybody in the council have any further questions, or would somebody care to make a motion to adopt that resolution? So moved. Is there a second? Second. We got a motion second to adopt resolution 2020-22 uh, as described. Uh, any further discussion? All those in favor of adopting the resolution 2020-22 say aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. Thank you. Uh, now we're back to Director Teague. Thank you, Ms. Hawker. And this is a um, request for a preliminary plat and final plat approval for 7101 and 7151 Metro Boulevard. Thank you, Mayor. Council, this is another relatively straightforward proposal. This property is located just south of 70th on Highway 100 or on Metro Boulevard. It's the former Regis office uh, center. There were three buildings associated with the Regis. The ones we're looking at are these two properties here. So again, two buildings existing on the site on one lot. What, the, what they'd like to do is just simply divide the property into two lots, create parking and driveway easements between the two properties. So the request is just a simple preliminary and final plat to establish both lots. This was reviewed by Planning Commission. They have unanimously recommended approval and staff recommends approval as well. Subject to that one condition that those easements need to be established um, for shared parking and driveway access between the two which the applicant has already drafted. It's just a matter of, of filing those along with the plat. So with that, I can stand for questions. All right, questions for Director Teague regarding this matter? Just one. Yes, Member Brindle. I guess just why? Why now and why? Uh, I, I, it's my understanding they don't intend to sell them separately, but it, it's a possibility, um, potential sale of one lot or, or both. It gives them a little more flexibility. It's not going to, I mean, would we have to establish a shared parking um, policy between the two buildings so that people could park wherever they want to between? Is that going to change? That wouldn't, so that protects both lots. Um, so ensuring that those easements are in place gives protection, mm -hmm. say, for lot two just to access the site um, from the road. So it's really just providing some protections for both lots should they be sold to separate owners. Okay. And that's right. a condition recommended by the Planning Commission, which is correct. embodied, I think, in the text of the resolution. That's correct. As a singular condition. Yep. Okay. All right. Other questions for Director Teague on this matter? All right. Stand by. Uh, this is also a public hearing matter. I'm going to open this up for public testimony. Is there anyone in the audience who wishes to come forward and testify regarding this matter, whether it's the applicant or uh, any other uh, party? Okay. Seeing no one coming forward, is there a motion to cl close the public hearing? So moved. Got a motion second to close the public hearing. Any further discussion? All those in favor of closing the public hearing, say aye. 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 Opposed? Second, second by yeah. Member Anderson. And um, with respect to resolution 2020-23, which would approve a preliminary and final plat at 7101 and 7151 Metro Boulevard, <clears throat> with the condition that uh, Member Brindle mentioned, which would be that uh, it will be subject to the following condition, a shared parking access and maintenance agreement shall be established on the property to share parking pedestrian and drive aisle access and maintenance as between the two properties in the future. Um, is there a motion to adopt that resolution 2020-23? So moved. Second. We've got a motion and second to adopt the resolution 2020-23. Uh, any further discussion? All those in favor of adopting the motion say aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. Thank you. And now the main event which is um, what I think neighbors are here to talk about and uh, the applicant as well, which is the last public hearing matter we have this evening, which is a request for a preliminary plat with variances for 5928 Ashcroft, Ashcroft Avenue. 
And Director Teague has this matter. Yes, thank you, Mayor, members of the council. This project is not so <coughs> straightforward. So this, pr this uh, property is located east of Concord Avenue, just north of 60th Street. Property was originally platted as two 50-foot wide lots. The original property owner combined two 50-foot lots and built one single family home. It's shown on the screen. I want to note that this property is located in the Fairfax uh, subdivision. It's really in the, the southwest corner. Um, properties across to the west of Concord are platted as larger lots, 60 to 75 feet wide, and south of 60th, also larger lots, 75 foot feet in width and larger. Um, so the Fairfax plat, they're all 50 foot wide lots. Some people did choose to purchase two lots um, and build one home on them. As you can see, the properties across the street, there's a 100 foot wide lot here, 5929. And these three properties are, or maybe it's these two, are a couple of 75 foot wide lots. So a little bit wider right across the street. So as you know, we calculate our, the median um, lots within, or for properties within 500 feet. So in calculating those medians, those larger lot areas uh, do come into, into um, play in calculating those medians. What did you say those average lot dimensions were south of 60th Street? South of 60th, they are, oh, in 70 to 80 feet wide. 70 to 80? Okay, and how about, uh, uh, square footage wise. Oh, um, I'd have to I'd have to look that one up. Okay. I don't know off the top of my head. All right, go ahead. So the request is a, a, a subdivision with a number of variances: lot width from 75 feet to 50 feet, lot area variances from 9,000 square feet to roughly 6,800 square feet. So I note that the median um, lot area in this in this particular case is just over 8,000 square feet and the width is 66 feet wide. So when we do these subdivisions within neighborhoods that are entirely within a, you know, within that 500 foot radius, they're typically the medians come back at 50 feet. Um, so this one, the medians are a little bit larger than some that we've seen in the past. So here's a look at the existing home. This would be removed. So it is 100 feet wide. The lots to the south and north are both 50 foot wide lots. Look at the existing property. Um, so they would tear that house down and build two new homes. I want to note that there is a 15 inch um, storm sewer pipe that runs along the north lot line. We're requiring a 10 foot easement uh, to protect that, uh, that pipe so they would need to maintain that 10 foot setback to the south. They would establish um, storm water ponds in the, rear, in the rear lot to slow down runoff as it moves off the property and uh, from the house would be directed toward the street. More detailed plans would be reviewed at the time of a building permit. So this is a, a graphic that I show. Um, we've done a number of subdivisions in this general Pamela Park area over the last 15 years or so. And the city has approved some and denied some. In instances when these types of requests have been denied, they have been on blocks where there's a variety of lots, uh, lot widths in particular. Um, so there could be a number of 100 foot wide lots um, within a certain block. So the site that we're looking at is located right here. And I want to point out, highlighted as 7 and 9. It's this corner piece here. In 2012, the property owner at that time requested the same subdivision. Um, to divide a 100 foot wide lot into two 50s, and it was denied. Uh, that same property owner came back three years later um, with that same request, and it was approved. The votes at that time were split. The recommendation from Planning Commission was five to four, and the City Council action was three to two. So these are an example of how they, they can go both ways. Um, so the primary issue that we considered here are the findings Sorry. for variance Sorry. met. Can I, can I just interrupt for a second? Can you go back one slide? So on that same one, there was also in, I think, 2016, 2015, no, if you go one forward, 2015 on this same map, 5825 Ashcroft. 
So Maybe. that one and 5829 were split. Correct. And that was approved. That was but approved. But that block has almost exclusively 50 foot lots. That was the last one on that block on both sides of the street. All the rest were 50 foot lots. Correct. Okay, yep. thank you. So primary issue are the findings for variance met. Um, in this case, staff is recommending approval, but staff has also provided alternatives for the council to consider. Uh, so we've provided findings for denial and approval. The Planning Commission held a public hearing a couple of weeks ago, and their recommendation, it was a split vote, it was three to three. Um, but sta in staff's recommendation, we really um, were influenced by the recent action here down on the corner. Um, the primary reason for recommending approval. It would reestablish the original plat. Um, there are two lots that are 100 feet wide left on this block. Um, again, uh, the practical difficulty would be uh, caused by the previous lot owner that had combined those two lots and built one single family home. We believe that it's uh, reasonable for within that block. Again, there's only two left. Um, that are 100 feet wide, and we believe it's reasonable in the context of the original plat and the neighborhood. So with that, staff is recommending approval of the subdivision and variances subject to the findings and conditions that are outlined in your staff report. And with that, I can stand for questions. Questions for Director Teague? I just, uh, Member Fisher. The, the whole radius, that as we look at that for what the median lot sizes are, the more I see it, the more I wonder if it's a, if it really works. Because in this case, I guess it works if you're somehow smack in the middle of a subdivision or of a, the original track, right? Right. In this case, you're on an edge. So by this rule, you would you would always have to have a variance based on the. Uh, just because it's on a fringe of a of the original track. That's right. And, yep. and how long have we had this particular rule in place? Ooh. You know, I'm not sure the the year that 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 ordinance was established. I believe it goes back to the 80s. Oh, that long? Yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks. But that was the issue on the corner properties, as I recall. It's called the. Uh, Lindquist edition, but I think, the, I think the fellow that owned it was named Lundquist, if I remember right. And um, we had that same discussion then about that 500 foot radius because the lots to the south that are bigger, that are consistent with each other, are causing the need for the variances. I right. think it's fair to say. You don't know exactly how it's affecting it, but it looks like it's affecting it. And then the one to the north that Member Staunton pointed out, if I remember right, that was a Johnson residence. Okay. Um, um, Member can, you just, can you just remind us all about what the rule is on the median? Yes, so the median really comes into play in establishing the minimum lot size for lots that are larger than 9,000 square feet and wider than 75 feet. We've required applicants to run the median even for areas that are less than 75 feet in width and um, less than 9,000 square feet just to give us a good idea of how well it fits in. And, you're, and that's been your practice to provide Planning Commission and the Council with that data as we consider each of these however many since 2006? That's exactly right. Okay. So it's become kind of a thumbnail for us to try to gauge how it fits in with the neighborhood. Correct, yep. All right, thank you. Other questions for Director Teague at this point in time? And um, the uh, applicant or the applicant's representative is here, I take it, and uh, did you tell them how much time they would have for their he, presentation? Yeah, he took about 10 minutes at Planning Commission. All right, okay, thank you. The applicant's representative is. Good evening. Hey, good evening. 
uh, Mayor, uh, members of the City Council. My name is Nate Reich. I, I own uh, NR Properties. Uh, address is uh, 3122 uh, 117th Avenue. <clears throat> and uh, you had mentioned uh, the lot splits, uh, 5825 and 5829. Uh, those were the first homes that we built in Edina. We got to know the, the, the members of the community, got to meet the, uh, just the families and, and introduce our brand to Edina as well. Uh, we recently were just at the Edina Redevelopment Contractor <laughs> Training and Edina has, there, as, a, as a, the city council members, as mayor as well, you guys are in a rock and a hard place. Uh, you really are, you have expectations of, of the community to uphold as well as retain the, the Edina name and the, the community. Um, and I've, I've spoken with a lot of the writers that have uh, voiced their opinions on the trees and the, the water issues in the area. And I've, I've done the best I can with answering with transparency uh, about the properties um, and the redevelopment uh, project that we look to hopefully you know, continue with in the city of Edina. Um, and I wanted to make sure that everyone knows that uh, with this particular property, it wasn't necessarily a lot split that we had in mind. It's a redevelopment of the existing structure. Um, and I didn't have a chance to talk about this at the last meeting, but we've had over 38 uh, families go through the property thus far without the ability to create uh, a sellable home in this market with the, com with the competition of being new construction. They would rather have a smaller footprint, affordable footprint, that they can um, put their own custom uh, you know, fixtures into and customize as a family. And uh, the market is looking for that right now. In, in the city of Edina, honestly, it's, uh, it is the, a very great school district, the people, and that's what's driving most of the buyers to Edina. 80% of our buyers are relo buyers. Their average, on average, annual salaries or net worth uh, per year is 430,000. Um, my background is banking, actually. I own four locations of refined lending, which is a mortgage banking uh, company. Edina, we have a branch in Edina, Blaine. I sit on the city council there. I sit on uh, the board council for our bank. And believe me, it's not easy sitting up there. Uh, where you're sitting as well to make decisions for the community. Um, I can tell you this though, that we try to do the best we can being transparent. Carrie, thank you so much for all your help. I mean, I, I lean on him a lot, just making sure we do the right things for this particular project uh, with some smaller footprints for these homes versus one large footprint of a, a massive teardown that might take some time to resell. Uh, so hopefully, if you guys have any questions, please let me know. I'd, I'd like to answer any of them. Uh, let me understand that, Mr. Is it Mr. Reich? Reich. Reich? Reich. Reich? German. Reich. C -H. <laughs> Reich. Reich. Well, that's what I thought I said, but maybe I didn't. It's a C-H at the end. Reich. 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 All right. Thank you. Um, Call him whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> So, Mr. Reich, um, you've given some contemplation to just tearing down the existing structure and, and building a new home that would be larger or of the same size. We you, have, Because yeah. you've had 38 people, 38 families go through there, and, and you've had no offer. No offer as of yet. We actually reached out to 11 different builders, our competition, to see if they had any renovation buyers that would love to entertain and as... Um, nothing yet. Uh, not saying mm -hmm. there's no no hope, but nothing yet as of today. And what's the price of the home? Uh, Eight fifty. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you tear it down, and you build a new home, and you talked about affordability. What's the cost? Uh, what's going to be the price of the new home? If it is one particular lot, uh, one home, it, it's going to be uh, a unique buyer that can afford the one point four to one point six million dollar range. There's been two sales in the Pamela Park School District by the school, two in the last two years. So it's not exactly something we want to do. We would we'd rather look at affordability in that nine, nine to a million range <coughs> on these lots. 
that, that's what uh, we would be looking at. Since, uh, and I think I emailed some of you guys, uh, we have three sales now as of today in 2020 in the school district uh, in this Concord area. So three, not, not all of them are real low buyers. One is actually an Edina residence uh, that's look, looking to, you know, they have a growing family, so. Other, Mr. Other questions for Mr. Reich? Yes, Mr. Reich. Thank you. I'll get you, I'll, I'll make you pronounce that right. I thought somebody Reich. over here said it was Reich, not Reich, <laughs> because I thought I started out saying Reich. It's not a K. Do I need hearing aids? It's no? not an SH, it's a CH. Anyway, it's just because we like to rib each other. Um, so if a single home on a 100 foot lot is gonna be in the one and a half million range, what would each of the homes on 50 foot lots be? Uh, the nine to a million range. Uh, that would be a square footage roughly 3,600. Uh, because of the one parcel having that drainage easement, we, we definitely want to make sure that we, we hold the size of the house smaller uh, and more, more affordable. That's a lot for a 50-foot lot. Okay, thank you. Bet. Thank you. Um, just a, a question. Um, so your basis is less than 839. Yeah. The accurate, yeah. So, mm -hmm. it, which makes your, your building proposal maybe a little more palatable based on that. Um, so what do you typically use in your building? Do you, what's your ratio, the site acquisition ratio to your finished product? Uh, the last three that we have purchased are 415 lot price uh -huh. only. And the end price is 1.225 on yeah. three of the, the homes we just So sold. about three to one. Yeah. yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. All right, thank okay. you. So these lot, if, if split, they're running so at 350 a piece, two, so that would be two. why we can hit the lower price points. If they're custom homes, the homeowners get to put their spin on the houses, so the selections are gonna be based off of their wants and needs, so. Other questions for Nate? <laughs> All right, thank you. Anything else you want to add? Uh, just thank you for your time All and right. the neighbors too. I know okay. it's, this is taking time out of their day too. So. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is a public hearing matter. I'm going to open it up for public testimony. I know that um, I had a meeting here the night the Planning Commission was meeting. I guess we were interviewing candidates that night. And uh, I saw many of the neighbors here that were concerned about this. So. Um, I think if you heard Ms. Benarat, you'll have three minutes. You'll get a yellow warning light. I think it's probably the same thing it did at the Planning Commission. And so feel, uh, feel free to come forward and give us your name and address, and, um, and we'll try to make sure we treat everybody the same and everybody gets their three minutes and try not to go over. And I'll remind you if you, if you hit the red light and we'll ask you to wrap up. Okay. Thank you, welcome. Hi, I'm Terry Joski lang and I live at 5917 Ashcroft Avenue. And um, I'm not in favor of the proposed subdivision of 5928 for the following reasons, of which I shared with the council um, Monday in an email. Adina's comprehensive plan in chapter three on land use and community design states that overall community character and livability are greatly valued in Edina. There will be a continual need to balance protecting what is valued in responding to needed ongoing change. This proposed subdivision is not needed ongoing change, but rather a response to a builder who would like to maximize his profit on his property purchase. We need to protect what is valued in our neighborhood, and that is the aesthetics and charm of our original smaller homes balanced with our larger new builds. When a builder buys a 50-foot lot, we don't have any say in whether they tear it down and build a home that what we see now from the front looks really resembles a garage with an attached house, the loss of our mature trees, and a front yard that is three-quarters driveway with a strip of grass. In this instance, the builder must apply for a subdivision, and we as residents 
have the opportunity to weigh in. My neighbors and I value character and aesthetic balance in our neighborhood. Some of us own these smaller 50-foot lots. The lots don't appear so small when the original story and a half homes are on it, but with the surge of new builds side by side, green space and light between homes is being eliminated, and lots appear, appear very small and crowded. I oppose dividing a 100-foot lot to create two more row houses. We are not opposed to all new builds, but existing homeowners want a balance of home size and maintain a variety of lot sizes. If the builder really wants to rebuild, he can do it on the 100-foot lot that exists. Edina's comprehensive plan also states that affordability is a central challenge in providing a range of housing options to meet the needs of Edina residents at all life stages and income levels. At the planning and zoning meeting, the builder cited that this subdivision was an opportunity to add affordable housing. I find this perplexing that you would tear down a home that previous owners had renovated and is on the market in the 800K range and replace it with two homes, which I know he said tonight an average of a million. The typical home that's been built is 1.2 to 3 million. Okay, need to have you wrap up, Ms. Lang. Is a far cry from affordable housing. So I just wanna say that right now, when we moved into this neighborhood, we bought at the top of the range when we paid 325,000 for our house. If we didn't have the opportunity to make that purchase, we wouldn't be able to live in Edina. Ms. Lang, it I is, need to have you wrap up. It's the only Ms. Lang, entry point. Ms. Lang, I need to have you stop. Okay. Thank you. I want to give everybody equal time. Is there any way to work this in? Sure, we can help you with that. Yeah, no. <laughs> and and you're, Ms. Lang, you're welcome to submit your written comments. Uh, we'll take them for the clerk and make it part of the record, too. Can you just click on And then we'll give you a handheld microphone. Okay. And then if you want to give us your notes when you're finished, you can sure do that too. Oh, okay. Thanks. That helps. Check, check. Okay, my name is Paul Lang and I'm a Ashcroft resident as well. This is the husband of Terry here. Um, just thanks for this opportunity here to come and present in front of you. Um, this is the housing question, just so that everybody knows, it was on the remodeler showcase a couple of years ago. Um, as a neighbor, um, I'm, I'm concerned about the crowding uh, on the street that we're starting to see. Uh, this is the proposed, or what you approved for the corner that was down Ashcroft and around the corner, I forget what the name of that. 100 foot split was but this is what you're looking at for two houses on a 100 foot lot um, i'm assuming they uh, may have had variances or they may have not but either way this is what we're looking at for the uh, crowding of uh, two houses on a split 100 foot lot this is my house here on the left and that's my neighbor's house just to the south of us these are typical 1950s single family homes with a one lane garage coming up the side, or one lane driveway, so you, typically a single car garage in the back. Oh, that's what a 50 foot wide lot sustained quite well uh, for growing families back in the 50s and 60s. That's another view. You can see there's plenty of light between the houses, uh, even with that large bush there in our fireplace, uh, shrinking the driveway, but those two houses work really well 
and they don't look like they're packed and laying on top of each other. This is a home that the builder uh, put up just a couple of uh, lots north of the proposed split. As you can see, it looks a lot different uh, than the 50-foot lot houses that I just showed you. What it looks like is a garage with a house built on the top and the back. What you don't get, like you saw on the slide with the two houses side by side, is a green area like this between the two houses. That's the existing lot there on the left uh, with plenty of permeable grass uh, and water runoff, water soak in area around the house. It's just like that on the south side of the house as well. So this is a nice example of uh, a yard. You can imagine kids in that yard. This is another typical look at a house, uh, an, again a 1950s house. When the woman passed away, her daughter inherited this house and she begged them, begged the new owner not to let somebody tear it down, uh, just because it, it had history there for the family. This is another example of typical construction on a 50-foot wide lot. Um, this is just to the north of my house. Again, typical garage. All the trees are gone. Nothing is left for the front yard except for a driveway and a little strip of grass there that would be on the left side of the house. Trees are gone. Uh, there's no light when the houses are packed between them and uh, very little front yard. Mr. Lang, would you give us your final wrap-up comments, too? You've hit the red. Yep, this is my wrap-up right here. This is Concord, just to the west of us, right over by the school. Uh, you can imagine um, builders looking at this street. And they're not, they're not seeing small houses. They're seeing one-point-something million-dollar houses after these are all torn down. These trees will all go. Uh, the tall houses will be built. They'll be on top of each other and they'll move on to the next one. In the meantime, okay. thank it's you, Mr. changed. So. Right, thank you. And you want to submit your written comments to the clerk? Sure. Good evening. Hi. Um, hello, Mayor Hufflin and um, City Council. My name is Patty Crater, and I live at 5924 Ashcroft Avenue. Um, my house was up on one of the slides when they were showing the house in question. Mine was the greenhouse on the right, so I'm just to the north. Um, I've lived at that property for almost 18 years, and um, I have many, many concerns about and against subdividing this property, but my main ones affect our house directly, and those are drainage issues. Um, there have been water problems in that general area since I have lived there. In fact, on Edina's um, city maps, or on the Edina City website, under the FEMA flood maps, it shows that the areas between um, 59th and 60th on Ashcraft and Concord, uh, the backyards are all part of um, what's called a chance flood inundation area. And we've experienced several water issues since we moved in. However, we did go ahead and drain tile, which definitely helped alleviate it. And um, the city did come in and put the large drainage pipe in between our homes, um, which is what the easement, the 10-foot easement, is about. Um, that has definitely helped. However, those areas are still very swampy. So currently, I have the new house to the north of our property, which was also up on the slide. It was the blue, very pointy house. Um, that house just went up about a year ago through NR Properties. The house directly behind to the west, also NR Properties, that is currently being built right now. And then these potential homes to the south. A big concern is all the additional hardcover, as well as the loss of all the trees that have taken place with this building. I have a very difficult time understanding how that will not affect the drainage. Um, I know that there are rain gardens that are um, on the plans to be put in, but I don't know if there are any statistics or anything that lets us know if these actually alleviate the additional rain problems or, or water problems. Um, when we did move in, 
actually the people that live directly behind us and that house is now torn down, like I said, it's currently being built. They had to actually suck the water out every time it rained. Middle of the night, that's what helped our yards actually not flood. Um, like I said, now with all the additional hard cover, I'm afraid of the fallout that's gonna happen later and I'm wondering who's gonna be responsible um, and how much that's going to affect our house. Um, besides the, the drainage, um, I also have concerns about the light, um, just the loss of natural light. I have, now again, I'm surrounded by, almost completely surrounded by large houses. Um, the one to the north, the west, and again, potentially to the south, they continue to get taller. They have to get taller because they have to be narrower to fit on these 50-foot lots. Um, and now this is gonna be affecting the southern end of my house, which is really where I get the most light, which I will not have any longer. Um, the proposed home is a good 20 feet deeper than the existing home that's on that lot. Um, so just to wrap up, those are my main concerns, um, is the water. And then also wondering when we lose our 50 foot lots to these giant homes, where, where will the small homes be for people that are interested? So okay. thank you. Thank you. Getting to the good part. Ooh, don't leave yet. <laughs> ah, they've got school earlier than I have to be up tomorrow. No, I don't think that has anything to do with it. You can way okay. to try to way to try to cover for them, come but on, I think uh, based on my walk a Saturday, they had to do one hour. It had to either be here. They or, got exercise too. Or with uh, with the good. walk. So. Okay, um, Janie Weston. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, 6136 Brookview Avenue in the Pamela Park neighborhood. Um, I am opposed to this lot being divided. Um, and I brought my tape measure. This is 15 inches. This is how wide that drain pipe is that was put in at the request of the neighbors in 2005 to deal with drainage issues. And that pipe needs to stay in good shape. It needs to not have construction equipment driving all over it, dirt being piled on top of it. Um, it needs to stay intact and it needs to do its job. Because back in 1987, when I lived in the Morningside neighborhood and I had uh, at that time the lowest backyard, um, in my block. <clears throat> I think it was late July, early August, we had, how many of you lived in Edina in 1987? July 23rd. Okay. We had a 12 plus inch rainfall within two to three hours that evening. And I know it was more than 12 because my neighbor had a six inch, inch rain gauge on her back deck and she emptied it twice. My backyard had water in it that was above my knee if I wanted to go wading in there. I know that the Concord Bowl created between Concord School, Southview, immediately filled with water at that event. It went spilling over Concord Avenue. It flooded everybody's basements to the east of Concord. Um, Ashford or Ashcroft Avenue 2. And for that reason, um, this lot should not be divided and that drainage pipe is crucial. If it were allowed to be split, you would basically have a 50 foot lot plus a 40 foot wide lot that shouldn't even have construction equipment driving across it. Um, those earth movers are very large, very heavy. A big pile of dirt piled right on top of it, <clears throat> excuse me, will disturb the soils on top of it and probably damage the pipe. Then the city will have to come right back in and put it back in. So um, that's my biggest concern here. This lot split request uh, for variance is not just another 50, 250s out of 100. This is a very unique circumstance. And I really have a problem with a home that just got completely renovated, being just torn down, 
and it's listed currently a market price of $850,000. And it was also um, within two weeks after the variance request went across the threshold here at City Hall, the owner listed in that request sold the house to Pinpoint uh, Homes LLC. And that has never been corrected by Mr. Wright, Reich, I'll get his name right. Um, why hasn't that been corrected? I need to have you wrap up. Ms. So Weston. I have some issues here with this and I'm really tired of seeing Pamela Park getting chopped up into more and more small lots. I really don't want to see it happen elsewhere too. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. I'm Sarah Ableitner, and I reside at 5916 Ashcroft Avenue. Thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. I am not in support of the subdivision of 5928 Ashcroft Avenue. Tearing down a sound functional home that was recently re renovated per Zillow in 2009 is not only wasteful, but it destroys the neighborhood aesthetic, charm if the single living dwelling is split into two future homes. If this lot is split in two neighboring modern homes or squeezed into a 50 by 135 foot lot, it doesn't match the existing 1950s feel of our street nor my home. This area and our neighborhood already have water problems and per the City of Edina website, our homes presently sit on a flood inundated area. Two new homes pushing the existing water issues and variances do pose an issue with impermeable surface. Two new homes are going to create more solid surface on this present lot compared to what's presently existing. And where does that leave us as the existing neighbors, homeowners and taxpayers? Per the City of Edina website, under redevelopment of neighbors, particularly number 11, it states, <clears throat> what should I do if I experience property damage? You guys probably know where this is at. But it states, if you experience property damage and that you know or suspect what's caused by construction activities, contact an attorney for assistance. Disputes between private contractors and property owners are civil matters in the city does not uh, intervene in private disputes. My home resides between two new homes that were teardowns. We were fortunate that the first home, teardown and remodel, we had no damage. We're still dealing with property damage with the second home just south of us with the same builder here at our residence. I will only share two of my list of grievances that I have documented for my own purposes. First, we still have cracked and broken concrete that's pulled away from the side of our house alongside our garage where our sidewalk and uh, patio are at. And we were forced to shut off our circuit breaker to our outside electrical outlet because we didn't want to have workers continue to steal electricity while we we're working, while workers were working at that home while we, my husband and I were working during the day. After false promises from the builder, we are now forced to have to address this issue on our own and civilly. It's not right to have our neighbors deal with the same burden. I'm asking for your help in keeping our community character intact and not allowing this lot to split. Thank you for listening and for your consideration. Thank you, Good evening. Uh, my name is Mike. Uh, all right, my name is Michael Du Bois. Uh, I'm on speaking here on behalf of my mother, Levon Du Bois, who lives at 5936 Ashcroft Avenue. It's to the south of the property. Um, 
from her house, she can look out her back window and see the bad decision of cramming the two houses on Concord onto the one single piece of property. And she can stand out in her front yard and see the decision of leaving the one big house on a double lot across the street, which she finds much more appealing for her end of Ashcroft Avenue. It just fits the neighborhood with the lot and a half sizes, the other, other double lots, and just is more appealing. Uh, one of her biggest concerns is a tree that has not shown up on any of the uh, plans. It's a tree on her property that borders the property to the north. With the construction of this house, they're going to bring the house 10 feet closer, or, or I think like six feet closer, which then will just disturb the roots of the oak tree. And with the other construction projects that have gone on in the neighborhood, they've killed most of the trees as they've run over them and compacted the roots. Uh, with this, this tree also borders up against her foundation. And if they start building it, how much damage could happen to her foundation, the death of the tree, and all these expenses would be left to her, which I do not believe is fair. If they leave it as, as is and remodel or expand to you know, one house, you have a little more variance in the distance between the houses, which could protect the tree, could protect the foundation from the roots being disturbed as they rip through the ground to build the basements in the new house. So she's, she's against the decision to subdivide it, and she feels like it's just more appropriate to keep that end of Ashcroft as it was with the double lots, lot and a half, as it transitions into the property south of 60th, which are lot and a half double lots. Um, it would be nice if you could put two small houses on there, like 50s lots, a GI loan lot, but that's not what's happening now. The idea of just putting two houses up there that's 1.2 million and saying that's easier than 1.6 of one, one house, there's no difference in that. It's still not going to be an affordable house either way. So renovation would be the, our, our her more preferred method of dealing with the property. So thank you. Good. Thank you, Mr. Dubois. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor and Council Members. My name is Jason Ableitner. I live at 5916 Ashcroft Avenue, so I'm three doors down from the lot where we're talking about dividing it. Um, I want to start by saying I support all the statements by my neighbors. I agree with everything that's been said here so far, and I will join them in opposing the splitting of the lot. Um, I had the pleasure of speaking to the Planning Commission meeting, and it was interesting after we spoke just to hear the rationale of the council members who were in favor of splitting the lot, and um, we've talked a lot about those tonight. But one I particularly want to talk about was um, the need to be fair and consistent with other requests to split the lot. That was one of the reasons given, and I, that's a great idea, and I fully agree with being fair and consistent. But I also think that each case needs to be taken on its own merits, and I think this lot is probably quite different than some of the other lots that were proposed to be divided. Um, but for one reason, we've already talked about it, we'd have the 10-foot easement on the side of the one lot. So you have a 50-foot lot, and the second lot, I would say, is effectively smaller than 50 feet. It's 45 feet or 40, however you want to look at it. So the house will be even narrower, narrower and that lot is even more fully reduced. Um, was also mentioned here tonight is the city acknowledges that there are drainage problems on this lot and in this neighborhood. Um, when they built the, put the plans together for the lots, there was extra allowance for drainage in these drainage ponds. And also as uh, mentioned, it's considered a flood inundation area. So I, I would contend this is not a standard lot. This is a lot that's already understood to have some water problems. And I can, I don't know what flood inundation area means necessarily. I just know when we get a heavy rain, when I walk to the back of my <coughs> yard, on my yard where neighbors um, boundaries my neighbors I can go out there will be ankle deep water so there's definitely water in this neighborhood that's everybody understands um, uh, the, the other thing I would challenge is if we're really doing a good thing for potential future buyers by putting these big houses onto these small lots I've had big houses built on both sides of my house and I know that uh, in both cases we've had some issues with increasing water into our house and it's not a pleasant discussion with new neighbors people buy these houses they spend 1.2 million dollars for a new house they're excited for a nice new house and it's just not a pleasant experience when you're having discussions with the neighbors while they um, ask you about your cracked concrete or why you have a sinkhole in your, your yard or you have discussions about where the downspouts are or where the uh, sump pump lets out. So I guess there's enough evidence to me to say this is kind of a unique situation that's probably not like some of those other cases where we talked about splitting a 100-foot lot. So thank you for your time. 
Uh, Mr. Abweitner, could I ask you a quick question? Do you know anything about the existing drainage issues at the subject property? Have you been back in that backyard at all? I mean, maybe one of the next door neighbors would have a I'm sorry, thought on that. I don't understand the question. Yeah, so like, like you said, when we get a heavy rain event, you've got you're kind of mushing around in your backyard. That's correct. Do you know what, what the situation is uh, at the present time on the larger lot to the south that's pro proposed for subdivision? In terms of what kind of water retention issues there are down there, or drainage issues, um, I, I don't know. Probably the neighbors okay. that are adjacent to it can speak more accurately to that. Okay. All right. Thanks, Mr. Abweitner. Yeah. I mean, here, here comes a, a first-hand observer. I think. <laughs> exactly. Can answer my question. Yeah. Well, I'll get to it. Yes. All right. All right. Uh, hi, my name is Barry Crater. I'm a resident for 17 years at 5924 Ashcroft Avenue. And I'm not in favor of this subdivision either of 5928 Ashcroft Avenue. And I'm with for five different points. And Mayor, I'll get to yours in point number two. Point number one is so I'm going to go back to the lot size. So in the condensed setback requirements for City of Edina single family dwellings, it states 30% ground coverage. When you review the plans online, one lot is going to be 40% coverage, the other one's 39% coverage. So as my neighbors already stated, that's going to create a lot of issues with this water. That's my second point, Mayor. So uh, first is the drainage pipe. So I appreciate the city back in 2005 doing that drainage pipe. That started to the west of me on the property of 5925 Concord Avenue, and then runs between my property at 5924 Ashcroft Avenue and the subdivision in question at 5928 Ashcroft Avenue. It did help alleviate some of the water, but we still have mushiness. And I'll use, I don't know if that's a word, but I'll use it, mushiness. Um, to answer the questions that were f for brought up. Um, what I can tell you is this, that the previous owner of 5928, um, they lost two trees, or kept losing the same tree in the corner, northwest corner of that lot. In fact, the city replaced it twice. And it was due to water. They couldn't make a tree grow. So as we talk about trees and everything else, you can relate to that tree couldn't grow because of too much water. And as of today, there's still a drainage about the size of, of this platform right here and when you go walk by it there's still water standing when there's a rain so um, it continues to be an issue as we think about this additional coverage it's going to become even worse and unfortunately as a dying resident I'm going to be faced with trying to deal with it and I don't feel that's fair to the residents of Edina particularly being here for 17 years the third issue I have is with the uh, plans online um, it's the interior side yard requirements between the two new properties, they have space of 14 and a half feet. Yet to the south on Mike's property, 5936 Ashcroft Avenue, it's 13.8 feet. And then my property to the north is 11 feet. So as we think about doing the right thing for the neighborhood, when they've lived here for how many years and I've lived here for 17, and these two new homes are gonna have better spacing than my house, that's when it turns into business and not about a neighborhood. Um, and then I'm gonna look at the lack of light. To my wife's point, uh, we had that large two-story built to the north of us, totally took our light away on the north side of our house. The plans that we see today, that will take the light away on the south side of my house. And then my final point is in regards to the neighborhood and just being transparent, as Mr. Reich was saying, Reich, excuse me, that their plan was to remodel this house, and I would question that because I see the plans to redevelop and put these two new homes on there were July 15th and this lot was sold in July. So that was pretty quick to say, I'm gonna try and remodel and, and flip the house when I have plans to build two new ones. I appreciate your time and your support in opposing this subdivision. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Trader. Good evening, evening, members of the council. My name is uh, David Guy. I reside at 5945 Ashcroft Avenue. My property is directly across the street from uh, 5928. Um, several excellent points uh, have already been expressed, so I may reiterate some of them, but I'd like to offer a few remarks. Um, I think it's one thing to uh, look at a neighborhood zoning map, uh, especially in a black and white drawing, but uh, it doesn't really um, tell anything about a neighborhood. Um, what you don't see at, on an aerial view um, are the mature trees, the vegetation, how the existing property fits with other houses in the vicinity. 
um, and perhaps more elusive and difficult to really describe. Uh, plan view doesn't tell anything about the overall character and charm of uh, a specific area. Um, so it may make sense um, from a plan view standpoint to go back to the 1950s lot size. Um, however, as we know, uh, we are not going back to the 1950s square footage on, uh, on a house, um, say about 2,000 square feet. Um, it's more than likely going to be double that, or if not more. Um, with all the associated change of landscape, lack of light, that have been uh, explained by, uh, by my fellow neighbors. Um, and as we just heard as well, uh, the potential drainage uh, issues that would result uh, from that split. Um, perhaps past decisions um, have been made to take a double lot and split it back to single uh, lots, and there, there may have been some very good reasons to do so. Uh, but I would hope that uh, the council will not take uh, a precedent and make it a general rule. Uh, I think that it should be addressed as a case-by-case -case basis. And uh, in this particular instance, the current property uh, at 5928 Ashcroft Avenue really fits in the na neighborhood. And uh, as you all heard as well, it was renovated only a few years ago. So it would seem rather wasteful to uh, tear down a perfectly good home. Uh, so in conclusion, um, I I hope that the Council will take into consideration the rather unanimous um, feeling which is shared by uh, uh, the residents and neighbors uh, that live in close proximity. Uh, we oppose um, the uh, proposed subdivision of 5928 uh, Ashcroft Avenue. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Guy. And I uh, like that French accent. Thank you. I can't get rid of it, unfortunately. Oh. Good evening. My name is Jennifer Lee. I live at 5921 Ashcroft Avenue. I originally purchased a home at 5929 Ashcroft Avenue in 1992. The house was built in 1918. I've seen the original abstract of that property. Mine was the first in the area. I sold it six years ago to a builder. I moved next door because I didn't want to leave these people. <laughs> um, but. They put a beautiful home on that double lot. It faces the park. The person that bought it now bought the home because it's hard to find a property that big, and she wanted a nice big yard. It's not easy to find a 100-foot hundred, you know, lot. And my house, built in 1918, was a perfect reason to tear that one down. <laughs> it was ready. It was ready to go. Um, it had several additions over the years that just couldn't quite, they couldn't build up, we couldn't build out anymore. So it had lived its full life. So my point in bringing part of this up is that the house, so the, the block across from, or the, excuse me, the house across at 5929 is a new house on the double lot. If you put a new house on the double lot across from it, you'd have a nice balance. If you take that and split it into two, you're going to have this very large house on this 100-foot lot that's going to seem a little out of place. I could understand if it were another lot that was a potentially that you could split it, but it's, it's not. It's a brand new house for $1.5 million. There were, when I moved in 1992, six beautiful trees on the lot. Three of them had to come down during the construction. Three of them came down three years after the build. She spent $2,000 to, to save one of the old oaks. The construction just took, took too much of a toll on it. And it was a winter build, and I know NR Properties is saying it's a winter build, it's not gonna damage the trees. It will, um, but I don't think that's one of the bigger issues. The water is definitely an issue for the neighbors. I also wanna to speak to the point of the lot sizes. Seeing the original abstract, the house that they're proposing to tear down on this double lot that somebody purchased two lot sizes, I, I'm pretty sure this house was built prior to the 1950s. So those 50-foot those lots were, were built in the 50s. This house was before then, and I, I didn't look up to, to see if that's accurate or not, but I believe this house was built in the 40s or 30s. Um, I have scribbled notes, so my apologies for not... Um, being too organized on this, but I do want to speak to, to the, the builder on this lot. He originally bought the house for 750. He painted and he put in some carpet and then marked it up to uh, over 900,000. 
It's now on round 800,000, I understand that, but he really didn't do a lot for $200,000, so in my mind, he wasn't really trying to sell the house as is. So that's Sorry. Thank you, Ms. Lee. Thank you. And you were not disorganized. You did an <laughs> effective, <laughs> effective job of advocacy. Is there anyone else that wishes to testify? Yes, sir. Welcome. Hello. Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Joe Bothwell. I live at 4549 Zenith in Minneapolis. And I'm here because my family may want to purchase one of the homes that are built on either of these two lots if it were to go through. And um, I've got a few specific points that, that I want to make, uh, and many of them have addressed everything that have come up already tonight. But I think in general, the theme that I'm thinking is it's really easy to focus on everything that could or might or possibly could go wrong with something. And there's the opposite side of two, and there's a lot of things that could go well. Um, there's, uh, I'll speak for myself and, and a lot of people like us, we're in Minneapolis, we're very familiar with the plight of teardowns and what it means. And those are, those are 42 lot, 42 foot by lots, I think, for the most part out there. So it, it is tight and, and the, there's polarizing opinions on it. There's no question about that. But I will say two things to, to the better. When people move in, you realize it's more about the people in the, in the community that you form more than the buildings. The buildings matter, but it, it's, it's who lives there. And at least in my experience, everybody's found out after the dust settles, uh, no pun intended, that you get along great and, and you get back to being neighbors and it's, it's a wonderful community. So that's one thing. It, it brings in people that are excited like us. We've got three kids. Oldest is going to enter kindergarten, youngest is five months old, and we want to move to Edina. And in this area in particular, for a lot of the same reasons everyone else wants to move to Edina. It's, it's a great community, engaged citizens, good parks, good location, and, and the schools. In fact, our three years are already part of the ECSC program. So, so uh, we, we want to contribute and make sure we're, we're part, of, part of something that we, we believe in. I also want to point out the water actually might get better. I, I'm not a hydrologist or I don't know the experts, but I do know there's, there's quite a lot that has to go into designing a good plan that actually gets water in, in the right spots. And um, perhaps it, it could be a win-win for everybody if, if this is designed well and, and the plans are done with the uh, spirit in which the, the regulations are created, uh, you, you could end up with a better situation. So with those things, a few things I want to say. One, uh, Nate and, and NR Properties, he and I have had I don't know, maybe a dozen conversations over eight months. And the first time we met, in fact, was at this particular property. And he was pretty transparent. He said this might go through to a split, but here's what I'd rather do is sell it as is. And he pointed out many of the things that he and uh, his team could do to, to change the property. It, it wasn't the right fit for our family, not even close, to be honest with you. And, um, you know, evidently the other people have gone through this, have found the same. So I think there was good intent there to do it. Um, I also think he's priced it fair in the sense that if it was any less than what it's on the market for, we would be here with the same situation, different builder. I mean, it's, it, there's some heavy economic currents that I think everybody's swimming, swimming up against with regard to what this, uh, what this looks like. The other thing I want to say about Nate, what I really appreciate is he's, he's more than willing to build a house that works for our family. And there's no, no way that we could afford the prices of all these new constructions that are happening. But he's, he said, you know what, let's, let's build a house that works for you. So that might mean not so many bells and whistles. It might mean you lose the designer touches inside and the Italian marble or, or what have you. Um, and it, it, instead, you get a house that works for family, is built well, and is under good condition. So I very much appreciate that. I wouldn't be here if it weren't for his flexibility. I think, uh, although I'll acknowledge it's not cheap by any stretch of anyone's imagination, you're tearing down a house and building a new one, it, it's a market difference from what many of the other builders are doing, and I think that approach should be Mr. encouraged and rewarded. Okay, I need to have you wrap up, Mr. Butwell. Uh, yeah, you bet. Uh, last, I mean, I mean last right now, things, I've let you drift it, over quite a bit. Yeah, yeah, I realize this can be Mr. a polarizing thing as neighbors. I've let you drift and, over. Um, Mr. Bottweiler, please yeah. stop. Please. Yeah. Oh, you want to be done. I thought you wanted to be like. No, I want you to be done in, because I let you drift on. over your three minutes. And if you want to make your comments, and I really appreciate you yeah. coming over tonight to say why you want to live in Edina. We love the idea of having you here. So let's. Very good. Thank you. We hope you figure something out. Um, okay. Anybody else? It takes some courage to get up in front of a group of folks that are your potential neighbors and say, gee, I'd like to be there. 
uh, with all of you. So I um, appreciate you coming over. Um, all right, anybody else wish to testify? All right. Uh, um, is there a motion to close the public hearing? So moved. Second. Uh, we've got a motion second to close the public hearing. Um, any further discussion? All those in favor of closing the public hearing say aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. Uh, one of the consistent questions, I think, was dealing with water. Yep. And um, we've, that's something we've developed a greater and greater concern about as the climate has started to change and we've been dealing with stormwater management issues. So, <clears throat> uh, Director Teague, I think I've got. Um, Uh, Patty Trader raised the issue first, I think, worried about drainage issues. Um, actually, somebody else mentioned this too, that we're in, they're in a flood inundation area. And um, what do we know about uh, the potential for uh, more effective water management, whether there's uh, that existing house there with some attention given to water management by whoever moves in, a tear down of that house on a 100-foot lot, in a, in a new house on a 100-foot lot or two houses on two 50-foot lots? What do, we, what do we know about how well moderate water can be managed so there's no greater amount of water being discharged on a neighbor's property than there is now? I might ask our city engineer, Mr. Milner, to help us out with that question. So yeah, mayors, members of council, part of any building permit, uh, if it is a lot split, we would require that they do not increase the rate of stormwater that's being sent to the directions it is today and also the volume. So there's a flood shape back there that was developed when the original plat was done. It's a low-lying area. There was a pipe that they mentioned installed in 2005. Recall in 2005 we had a much different understanding of rain events and flood events, so that pipe was designed to a much different standard, so I would assume that's not working as well as it was in 2005. But They've submitted some preliminary uh, calculations in the stormwater, and they're, so far they're showing that there is no increase in that peak rate or the volume. We're also suggesting if they could send any of that water instead of the backyard, send it to Ashcroft Avenue where there is some capacity down the street instead of sending it to that backyard. If they keep the existing house like you've asked, there'll be no changes to the stormwater unless they do a, uh, in addition to the home. So there's no requirements we could put on them if that existing house stays in place. If they tore the existing house down and we did not approve this particular request for subdivision and they built a new house, would that be easier to manage water off of a structure like that than it would be off two houses on two 50-foot lots? They would both be held to the same standards, no increase in rate and volume. So whether it's one big house, we would still hold the same standard as mm -hmm. two smaller houses. Okay. I think uh, uh, Mr. Reich mentioned that um, he'd probably build a couple of 3,400 square foot houses, so I'm assuming that that's, a, that's roughly, let's say, a 7,000 square foot footprint on a single home on that particular lot, a 100 foot lot. Um, what, do you, what do you typically see for a footprint on a lot of that dimension for a single house? Maybe Carrie, Director T could answer that. I'm, I'm thinking about hardscape now. Here we got yeah. close to 7,000 square feet. If you got two, 50, uh, two houses on 50 foot lots that were basically 3,500 square feet a piece, or you're talking 7,000 feet of hardscape. Yeah, and so. Versus it, probably not that much on a 100 house on a 100 foot lot. Yeah, if it, if it were two 50 foot wide lots, they couldn't exceed our impervious or our building coverage requirement. Um, that would be 30% of a 50-foot wide lot. With a 100-foot wide lot, they couldn't exceed 25%. So there, there likely would be a little bit more green space with a 100-foot wide lot. Um, in terms of the impervious surface, just to give a, an update where we're at with that, we've been working with the engineering department and drafting an ordinance that's going to regulate impervious surface. We introduced it to the Planning Commission last week, we're, we'll still be going through some tweaks, but um, that's on our work plan to, to have an impervious surface requirement in addition to building coverage. Okay. Um, 
some of my other council member colleagues uh, have other questions that they noticed that were raised or issues or concerns that were raised. I, I'm just, I'm curious about Member Fisher. the, um, this pipe that people are talking about and the fact that we need to have an easement on both sides of it. Uh, and it struck me, the comment made that in reality, it's not two 50 foot lots, it's a 50 foot lot and something less. So what, what is that real buildable dimension on the one lot compared to a typical 50 foot lot in this neighborhood? Yeah, so a typical 50 foot wide lot would require a combination of the two side yards can't be less than 12 feet. So they could have seven feet on one side and five feet on the other. In this case, with that 10 foot easement, it would be 10 feet on one side and five feet on the other. So it's really, it's only, um, what a difference of three feet. So is that full easement on this parcel or is it between two parcels? Currently, there is no easement there. So as part of this plat, we would require that 10 foot easement. I don't believe, I'll ask Mr. Milner to correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't believe there's an easement over that pipe today. So is the pipe entirely on this parcel? It is. Yes, it okay. is. It was installed in 2005 and there were supposed to be easements um, gathered at that time and there weren't. So now's our opportunity to mm. get those easements so we can maintain that pipe in the future. There was another comment about damage to that pipe during construction. We're going to require that that pipe is not damaged and if they do damage it, they got to replace it. So that's going to be a requirement of any permits of working around this pipe. How did it, how did we arrive? Well, maybe no one here knows, but um, would it be, is it unusual that the pipe would have been on one parcel instead of right on the line between two parcels? When you look at where the homes were situated, I think there was no space, the other home is too sure. close to that property line. There was no space mm -hmm. to work next to that foundation. So okay. this one had extra space because it was a uh, one single large lot and the home was centered. So it's really, going back to my original question, it's a difference of 15, this situation is 15 feet of unbuildable area on a 50 foot lot versus a norm of 12. Correct. Okay. Thanks. Uh, that had two, it caused two questions, that dialogue for me. One is, uh, if um, we didn't approve this and uh, Mr. Reich decided to build uh, a new single family home on a 100 foot lot, could we still in impose that same condition and you know, maybe put in a bigger pipe that, and get the easement that we would require in order to manage water better in that particular area? I don't think so unless it required variances. They would maybe offer it to us at this point if we work together on it, but I don't think we could take it without a variance request and condition it on something. All right, so for then, then the other question is for you, Director Teague, is on the, on the footage numbers that you mentioned, on the side yard setbacks at 12 feet you have to work with, could you require that the um, seven feet uh, on each lot be the dimension that abuts the existing neighborhood and, and cause the two new houses to be on five foot setbacks as in, in relation to each other. So they don't, so somebody didn't say, some, the builder didn't say, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take the 10 feet and spread the houses as far apart as I can from each other, which pushes them, it gives them the five foot dimension to use on the side yard setback towards the existing neighborhood mm -hmm. on each side. Can, can we, could we require if we, so choose to subdivide this to, to, as a condition, require that the that the short footage be uh, in the, the middle between houses. the two new houses. You could make that a condition of approval, I, but yes, you could. Okay. Um, that was a good uh, question, Member Fisher. I've been wondering about that pipe myself, and people have raised some pretty interesting issues about it. Um, Is there, uh, from the street photo, I didn't get a chance to drive by there, but it, you know, it, in times past driving by, I think when the Johnson property was subdivided, I remember driving by and that part of Ashcroft, all those lots were the same except for that Johnson lot, which was a 100 foot lot, but they were all level to each other, at least on the east side of the street. This one looks from the street like it's got some elevation above the adjoining properties. Is that just a function of the way the, the camera worked or the, 
is, is there, is, do we have any elevation change there on those property, on that property vis-a-vis uh, -vis the neighboring properties to the north and the south? Where that pipe is, is kind of the low area of the block. Everything comes down to that location, and specifically in the backyards, but it's, it, there's not a lot of, I got two foot contours, there's not a lot of change between the properties. Okay. Are you aware, Mr. Uh, Milner, of the issues with the um, loss of uh, existing trees in the northwest corner of that particular property over time where they've replaced two trees and they haven't been able to sustain themselves because of the excess of moisture in that corner of that lot? Do you know anything about that? I think Mr. Well, Trader raised that yeah. issue. I'd say the, the the neighbors can probably speak to this better, but when that pipe went in, we probably tried to plant a tree and it didn't survive, and then we tried to plant another tree because of the work we did back there. There's probably promises with landscaping. Looking at the flood shape back there, I'd say, yeah, it's probably a problem, just it's too wet <clears throat> all the time for trees. We have many of these shapes uh, where, where there's just too much water for certain species of trees to survive. If you were going to, uh Try to manage water as best you could in that neighborhood now, uh, knowing what you know today versus what folks knew back in 2005. What would you change? This leads into a good. We're going to have a good work session here on March 4th because we'll be talking about the uh, flood risk uh, strategy. I think it's education and knowledge. You know, there's there's only so much we can do with infrastructure. Let's start to flood proof and lower that risk on individual properties. Um, we can can only put in bigger and bigger pipes up to a point because we're just pushing water downstream. So to say if we could just put a bigger pipe here, I'd have to do a much bigger analysis to see if we're going to flood somebody else downstream. But I think it's having residents have that knowledge of the issue and how can they protect their own properties with sump pumps and maybe berms. And when a new house goes in, we raise it up and get it out of the flood shapes. And as properties develop, that's an opportunity to get people out of those risk areas. Well, when you raise them up, doesn't that just create a situation where you've given the water a better chance to run off to adjoining properties? That's where we require that no rate or volume increase. So then they have to build other things on that property, rain gardens, swales, to underground keep tanks, on their own keep it on their own property. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, in my experience uh, over the years, these are uh, particularly fact-specific situations, and I was looking at the updated list Manager Neal sent around today. It's a, it's a, an array of uh, grants and denials. And so I think you have to look at each particular situation uh, in a factually specific way. And so I don't know if anybody has uh, some initial thoughts they want to share on this particular request. I know it was a... It was a befuddlement for the, the Planning Commission. I guess they only had six folks there that night. It was a 3-3 vote, I think is what I heard. Three thought it was okay and consistent with what we'd done before, and three had concerns. Um, Member Fisher, I, did you I have, have another question? I have one more question, and that yeah. is, it wasn't that long ago, maybe a month ago, we approved a lot split um, over actually just a few blocks north and west of this one? Correct. And it feels like we had about the same number of people here, and I think every neighbor got up and said, this is a great idea. They did. What was fundamentally different, and I, I wish I would have thought of this earlier to go back and see if I could find it in my info, but is it stormwater differences? I don't remember any discussion about wet you know, kind of the, the, the water problem. Um, and then in that case, it was also still the homeowner that was represented, right? Correct. So they hadn't gone to that next step of selling their property. They were gonna, they were sort of taking the bull by the horn while they were still owning it, dealt, you know, talked with their neighbors and all that. Was that fundamentally the other difference? That is, in fact, they were going to build one of the two houses live in it they, and live right. in it yes okay. that site was it was high there's a quite a large drainage pond to the west 
I think the fundamental difference in that one was across the street, those lots faced the other direction. And, and they, um, while they were slightly larger, there was no driveway entrances straight across the street. And if there was a heavy row of trees to provide some landscaping as well. Okay. But that, that was right on the edge of, of that plat, too, for 50-foot wide Right, lots. and that's what I remember. It's like we, just as I was looking at the, you know, the median lot size and everything, you know, that's, you know, clearly there was a variance, but it just seemed to be kind of a, made so much sense, and nobody in the room thought it was a bad idea. And, uh, you know, it feels very different here this evening and trying to understand the specific differences. Thanks. Sure. Member Staunton, thank you. Okay. So let me, I'll just share some of my thoughts and then wait to hear from my colleagues. I, I think the first place to start here is that, you know, there's been a lot of discussion about the new houses in the neighborhood on 50 foot lots. And it's really not about that because this isn't about what you can build by right. Those houses get to be done because there's 50 foot lot, they abide by height limits, setback limits, et cetera. What we're here tonight to talk about is whether we should make an exception to the rules. And there's a set of criteria that we apply to decide if we should make an exception to the rules. And it's basically designed to avoid an unfair situation when the rules are applied as they're written. And when I look at this, there's really, there's three pieces to the practical difficulties test that I think are applicable here. The first is the requirement that the plight of the landowner is due to circumstances unique to the property not created by the landowner. Now I get that this was platted as a 100 foot lot sometime before this landowner purchased it. But to me, the key word in this one is unique. And that's the difference for me between this neighborhood and the block to the north. When we did the 5825 Ashcroft situation, it was unique in that block. There was not every single lot other than that one was a 50-foot lot. And it seemed unfair from that perspective to have to require them to keep a 100-foot lot. In this neighborhood, as the median analysis shows and as some of the testimony has shown, there's a lot across the street that's a 100-foot lot. There's three lots that are more than 50-foot across the street. In the 50-foot radius, there's a lot more so that this um, median is much higher at 66 feet, I think, is the width and, and the, the lot area as well. Um, so to me, they don't meet that test. And then the second is really the issue about whether it'll alter the essential character of the neighborhood. And we've had a lot of testimony tonight about that, and I think it's similar to the discussion on, you know, to the opposite discussion in the 5800 block of Ashcroft. But here, I think many of you have spoken eloquently to the point that there's a variety of different size houses. All you have to do is go and stand on that street and look at this house and then turn completely around and look at the house on the other side that's a larger home. But, you know, it certainly would be in that same range. So it, this isn't, you're not, by cutting it into a 50 foot lot, you are changing that feel of a variety of different lots. And, and I would only do that in the circumstance where it's closer to that 50-foot median. And, and as we've gone back over time, I looked at a lot of the, you know, I think four of us up here have actually been around for all but at least one of these, either through the Planning Commission or the Council. So we're getting used to this, uh, this kind of request. And so I think it's a, it doesn't really, I think changing this house to a 50-foot lot would alter the essential character of the neighborhood from that perspective. So the third thing that I wanted to address just briefly is the notion of, in the statute, and we didn't talk a lot about it in the staff report, but there is a notion that economic considerations alone do not create a practical difficulty. And, and I, you know, from the records at Hennepin County, you can see that the lot was bought for $700,000. And as the builder testified, it's about a three to one ratio. So really, if he's gonna rebuild on this property, he's gonna to have to build about a $2.1 million house. And I get that that's not gonna work in this neighborhood, but that's an economic consideration that really isn't for us to worry about. Um, and so that's a decision that he made. And frankly, 
you know, looking on Zillow where it's where it is um, listed, it looks like a pretty nice house, and maybe it's just overpriced at eight fifty, and maybe closer to that seven hundred thousand dollars might do the trick. But that's really not for us to worry about in the variance analysis is whether it works economically for the builder or for the buyer or not. Um, so I think in this circumstance, this doesn't, doesn't get far enough for us to grant an exception. It's not unfair to keep the lot at the 100 foot. I think it fits into the neighborhood the way it is, and there's nothing unique about this in the neighborhood. So I would be um, supportive of a motion to deny the application. Good, thank you, Member Sutton. Um, Anyone else care to comment, Member, Member Anderson? Thank you. Um, I, I guess uh, I would just reiterate all the right questions have been asked up here tonight, and I, I appreciate that. Um, most of my concerns focus on drainage and uh, stormwater management. I guess the, the, the question that hasn't been completely asked is for Director Milner. Um, I know that there are rain gardens specced into uh, potential future building plans. And um, I'm, you feel comfortable that the rain gardens would handle the additional water uh, along with the existing drainage pipe? Everything's designed to a certain standard. So it's that 1% annual event. Mm -hmm. you know, there's no way we can treat a 1987 storm. So if that's the expectation, it's right. not going to make it. But yes. we're trying to hit the 1% event. Um, is the soil composition over there, a lot, is there a lot of clay there? Is that one of the reasons that we have? the runoff issue and the, 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 the sogginess that's been described? Um, I don't know the soils. They'll have to submit those with their final stormwater calcs, but it is just a low bowl in the backyard. Mm -hmm. So if it doesn't drain away, then you would assume there is some clay layers in there versus some of the other neighborhoods where it's sand and it's gone in just minutes or hours. And then you touched base earlier on the potential of replacing the drainage pipe and or somebody did, um, and I'm just wondering, is that an option? And I think you, you more or less answered that question by saying we could go to larger pipes, but we also create the potential of further runoff, pushing it downstream, essentially. We would have to have our stormwater consultant take a look at that and see what the impacts are. This goes down to St. John's Park, down the, then south of Valley View. So is there other homes by increasing that pipe size and speed of the water leaving that backyard? where now it might not be doing any structural issues, it might cause structural issues downstream. So it would be a much bigger study and review of that. Okay, thank you. Um, just to allude to uh, part of uh, the presentation earlier about affordability, and I, I guess I don't see affordability entering into this discussion at all. We either have a $839,000 single family, which may be a bit overpriced, I, I think, um, or we've got two 900,000 plus homes. And so the discussion of affordability doesn't, I, I don't believe in or in. I don't think, we're not building affordable housing here. Um, and taking a look at the, uh, at the, at the uh, earlier applications for variance, um, it's, it's all over the place. Um, eight out of 13 of those that were uh, in the uh, staff report here tonight, eight of 13 were granted. Um, so that's kind of split, similar to the Planning Commission split. Um, the, I, I guess in the end, um, I, I, I view this as uh, a, an acquisition of a property at, uh, with an intention to turn it over, to do some work and turn it over, which hasn't worked out. And so that's why we're considering the, uh, the application for variance. Um, so I, I tend to reflect uh, Member Staunton's observations uh, about the economic considerations not really being part of what we have to consider. The, um, the drainage issues and the existing water concerns there really have my attention more than anything else, however. And so um, as we go forward, I, I'll, I'll have that foremost in mind. Thank you. Thank you. Member Brindle, thoughts? Thank you. Um, as with most of these subdivision requests um, that, that we end up discussing and wondering about, some of them, as, as the one on Oaklawn, what was pretty, pretty straightforward, and the one on 
the, the, the one north on, on Ashcroft that was all flat. Um, stormwater mitigation is, is something that as we have looked at, um, it could be a home built on an existing lot and the stormwater problems that the neighbors, the, the adjacent neighbors um, end up experiencing are laudable. They're, they're, they're unfortunate. And you look at the variety of um, mitigation efforts that were asked for, and you really wonder, are they even there? Because um, it just doesn't look like the water is going toward the street. The water is going on the neighbor's property. And um, this, in this situation, the elevation if two new homes are put here, are they going to be at the 800, the 880 elevation, or are they going to be built up? They're going to be built two feet above the flood shape. And I just want to clarify one of your comments about we don't remove where water's going after we don't require applicants to, if water's going to an adjacent property today, somebody builds a home, they still have the right to drain that property in that same direction. So we don't like to stop water from draining across current properties. So I just want to make sure that's... Right, but it's not supposed to any, be any more than it used to be. Anymore. So it still can drain in the same drainage path that it's been there for basically since it was developed. Right. Um, so looking at the fact that the front of this property is higher than the back, draining toward the street, how would you drain the stormwater to the street when the front is higher than the back? Uh, it's split about in the middle of the lot today, and we would say you've got to follow that for the future, but then you can look at roof lines and rain uh, downspouts and where are you running. You can do some drain tile out to the front. There's a lot of options with the roofs on how you collect that water in the downspouts and gutters and send that in different directions than it goes today. Well, and looking at a home that um, Member Staunton and I visited in Morningside, next door is a home with a big roof. And um, what, what's happening on Lynn Avenue is the, the backyard, I mean, they were trying to sell the house. I don't know if they've sold it yet, but they were sump pumping the backyard to try and get the water out to even be able to see the grass. And um, and it, this was a particularly wet year, and they had a new house with a big roof on the back. Um, so what we did suggest is they try just redirecting the downspouts away from their property, away from this particular property. Um, so I, we have situations that we hear about all the time where a new build has occurred and now water, the water situation is completely different. I would, so, I would just add a, a point about the wettest years on record. Over the, People are seeing stuff they've never seen before because of the, the amount of water and precipitation we're getting. And it happens to happen right when that house is built next door. And they're linking it to that, and we're going to share on March 4th where that really isn't the cause of these issues. It's just we're getting twice as much water as what we have typically have seen in the past. Okay. And it's easy to link it to a new building right next door of your property. All right. Well, every one of these, it is stormwater that, that I do consider because when you have a 50 by 130 lot, that's not a lot of space. And when you've already got stormwater challenges, um, mitigation efforts are, are really tough to, to land on. Um, the comment that trees are really not a stormwater issue, they really are a stormwater issue because they drink water, they drink hundreds of gallons of water and you get rid of a tree and that water is gonna stand in your yard. So a tree is definitely a stormwater issue. So when we look at um, 
subdivisions when we look at how a property is going to be redeveloped. We do have a tree um, preservation policy. Um, might be an ordinance. I'll bet it's an ordinance. Okay, it's an ordinance. Um, but during the building, uh, the time that the that the property is being rebuilt, um, the builder has to preserve the trees and or replace them. And we do keep an eye on that, but if you've only got 50 feet to build on and you've got major trees on that lot, they are going to be subjected to some, uh, some real challenge during the time of that build. Um, and then you hope that the new owners respect the trees enough to keep them once, once the home is there. And the, home, the two homes at 60th and Concord took out all the trees. And now there's a row of arborvita there, which is not, they, they are not sitting where the water sits on that property, which is on the back of that property. Um, so those, those really are the red flags for me. Um, as I read the recommendation, um, as, as it states that uh, the context of the neighborhood, the, the 250 foot lots fit in the context of the neighborhood. Um, the subdivision is reasonable. Uh, the way I look at it is the current property um, is reasonable because as you go south on Ashcroft, the lots get larger and larger and you cross 60th and the lots are uniformly larger. larger. And so, uh, as I see it, I think it does fit. Um, I think that the uh, understanding that without redevelopment of this property, we, we as a city can't say, here's how we need to, and the property owner needs to fix the stormwater problem. So that, that is an issue, but, um, but I still think as I read the approval resolution and I read the resolution of denial, it is the resolution of denial that really, I, I agree with the points in it straight on. So uh, I do, you know, in a way I apologize because I know that, um, I know that there's hope to, hopes and dreams tied to new homes. Uh, but I, I do hope that uh, what happens on this 100-foot lot uh, as it gets a new owner and, uh, and that owner respects um, environmental um, improvements and sustainability and improvements in stormwater that not only benefit that lot but the neighborhood, uh, I think it's what's best for the area. Thank you, Member Brindle. Member Fisher? All right, so this one is really a tough one. Um, I was trying to figure out, you know, why so tough, but I think I've figured it out, and, and part, for me at least, uh, this is all about sustainability. Um, so when I first looked at this in, in my packet, I felt it was sort of a slam dunk. Why wouldn't you subdivide this lot? Uh, the parcel size is relatively consistent with the original plat. If you, if you look at the block and the street and look north uh, with, with the area. Again, just looking at it from kind of an aerial photo, parcel map. Um, at that level, it feels like the neighborhood character wouldn't be affected. Um, and from a sustainability perspective, I, I look at it, and I've talked about this in other subdivisions, the one a month ago, I specifically talked about um, the sustainability factor of having another family. You can add another family to this block you know, less than a block from a school. They don't have to drive to school, you know, so, so we can have a productive, uh, another family living in our community. And, you know, we had an example with Joe back there, you know, you know a new family, potentially. And those are all good things. Uh, and I've also talked about, you know, we have a lot of concern in our city about um, the cost of street reconstruction and the new utilities. And, you know, you add another home, you have another, you know, 5% less cost for each one of you on that factor. And then I showed up tonight 
And this is why public hearings are so important. Uh, because what you do is you hear from the local experts, the people that live there and, and see this thing not from an aerial photo, not from a parcel map, but from next door and, and across the street. And, and it's interesting, sort of the personal accounts of what's happening with stormwater and, and some of these other issues. And, and I think, for me, that's the other side of the sustainability equation, is that we know we have these issues with, with stormwater. We know these rain events are getting bigger. Um, and while I appreciate the comment that, and we'll learn more apparently soon, about the impact or lack of impact on these builds, the, the fact that you can't argue that you know more coverage is more coverage, and and so how do we how do we manage that? Um, I think when it comes down to it, and, and, and part of this, so so I've actually been in this house, um, and it's a beautiful house. I I, I you know it, when you look at the photos of the outside, it's a great house. Um, I haven't been in any of the private spaces in this house, but they'd have to be pretty horrible if you can't sell this house. I mean, it's a nice house. Um, and so it might be just getting the price right or something. But um, but I think the, the reason I bring up the, the, the economic factor here of this house is that economics are going to dictate what has to be built if this thing gets taken down. Whether you put it on one house on this 100-foot lot or two houses on two 50-foot lots, uh, it's going to take a lot to a lot of volume to to work economically, and and I worry about that. Um, you know, when you when you try to do this on two 50-foot lots, one that's actually going to be a little narrower, and and that will have impacts on the neighbors, and I think um, that's uh, an important factor. So as I I've sort of come full circle as I've sat here tonight and I've listened and I've thought about these stormwater impacts and um, I think Council Member Staunton, uh, you must be a lawyer or something because you, <coughs> I think you articulated in a very lawyerly-like way um, why, um, why it probably makes sense to deny this one. Thank you, Member Fisher. Uh, for me, um, a couple of, of things are important to consider. Um, we've been uh, more and more concerned as a community about how to manage stormwater. You know, one of the reasons we did that, that great project over at Arden Park was to better manage stormwater coming out of that 50th and France area because we know more water is coming our way. You know, we're having 500-year we're having floods every three years now. And, and, uh, it's it's something that everybody has to be concerned about. So when we look at these situations on a one-off basis, <clears throat> factually intensive in every circumstance, uh, you can't help but be persuaded by uh, the idea, I think Ms. Patty Trader talked about it, was a, it's a chance flood inundation area, and we've talked about how wet it is in that neighborhood. So I am concerned about uh, how we manage uh, stormwater in that area uh, effectively or improve what we're doing now. And I don't think two houses adds to the, uh, to, to the, to the um, notion that it'll be easier to manage stormwater than having one house there. The, uh, for, for me, the existing property is a conforming single family residential lot. It's, there's a reasonable use that exists there today. Uh, I don't find there to be any practical difficulty uh, as alleged by the applicant's proposal that, uh, that this need to subdivide the property is, is essentially self-created. And um, so to me, there are no practical difficulties in complying with the uh, zoning ordinance standards as they exist. Um, the concerns over not being able to sell the, the property as is to me, as Member Staunton mentioned, is an economic issue, and that's an issue pr particular to the purchaser of the property, and one that can be solved either through patience, waiting for the right buyer for this nice existing home, or making a determination as to whether or not you want to tear that house down and build a single <coughs> house that kind of matches up with the one that's across the street. And I think it gives us a single home on that property if it's new, gives us a chance to at least think about how to better manage some water in that area. I know um, Director Milner um, wasn't convinced of that, but it does seem to me that uh, one house there instead of two 
with um, maybe a footprint of um, 4,000 square feet instead of 7,000 square feet on the first level. It, it means a lot in terms of being able to manage water. So I'm going to I'm going to vote to uh, deny this request for a variance uh, as well to create two lots here instead of one. So um, I think you've got a uniform opinion on uh, across the council on resolution 2020-24. Uh, is there a motion to adopt the version of resolution 2020-24 that denies the preliminary plat with variances at 5928 Ashcroft Avenue? So moved. We got a mo motion and a second. Second. Motion from Member Stoughton, second from Member Anderson. Any further discussion? All those in favor of the motion as stated, say aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. Thank you, folks, for your input tonight. It was very helpful in making a decision, all of you. All right, uh, we're going to move on to a correspondence of petitions. And um, anything on the that's come in, Manager Neal, other than what's on the dais this evening? No, nothing more than, than okay. uh, that's on the uh, dais. Aviation noise update, Member Brindle. Thank you. Uh, the Uh, it had so aviation noise uh, and noise oversight committee. The situation hasn't changed since the last meeting, uh, where we are continuing to learn more about the FAA's um, plan. And it's a it's a plan that didn't start last year. It didn't start this year. It started many years ago, to uh, to go to the place where airplanes fly according to GPS coordinates rather than the physical coordinates that are on the ground called VORs and it's a big white thing. And there's one at every airport that you can think of, small airports, large airports. And so the FAA is planning to decommission not all but most of the VORs and that they would be, the ones that remain would be used when GPS is for some reason not working. So um, we're just continuing to learn more about that. There are some concerns uh, uh, on the part of some of the members of the Noise Oversight Committee on what that's going to mean for flight tracks. Are they going to be concentrated or are they going to be more fanned? Uh, we don't know. And so we're continuing to learn more. And um, there is the FAA has now we've got for about the last four months. And going forward, we have uh, a woman, Rebecca McPherson, uh, and she sits in our noise oversight committee meetings. I'm sure she's in the MAC commission meetings as well, um, but representing the FAA. And, um, and her purpose is really to be that, that person we can ask questions of. So, uh, so it's great to have her, and this is, this is a discussion where she will be a big part of answering our questions. So we have a discussion with Lauren Olson, who is government affairs person in the city of Minneapolis. And um, so an air, a, pretty much an airplane that comes over and causes noise in Edina has come over South Minneapolis and or Richfield. And so um, we coordinate the messages that we have with Lauren so that's coming up, so that's my, and, and then uh, I will be in Washington, D.C. in March at the Congressional Cities Conference where there will be a meeting of noise, which is a nationwide um, uh, a aviation noise um, coalition. And uh, we will be talking about this because it doesn't what, matter what airport in the United States you're, you're close to, the VOR is part of the discussion in that area. So that's coming up. And that meeting is uh, Monday, March 9th in the afternoon. Great, thank you. All right, very good. Um, anything supplemental, Manager Neal, on that issue? All right, uh, council comments, Member Fisher. Uh, 
The only thing I have is just to thank my fellow council members who uh, attended and uh, conducted the interviews for our commission members. And I apologize. I was, I've been traveling a great deal and uh, was not able to make the first two. And I had to make a tactical decision for the third one, thinking, what good am I being at one out of three when I can't help you evaluate the, the folks that you interviewed on the previous night? So I appreciate the work that you did. Thank you. Member Stoughton. I would echo that same thing. I, my health prevented me from being there. I appreciate my colleagues um, doing what looks like a great job of filling out the rosters on the commissions. Thank you. Member Brindle. Thank you. I have a couple things. So um, I spend uh, a lot of my time when I'm not sitting in this chair on transportation. And it was a few weeks ago that I met with Kevin Burkhart, who is the chair of the Highway 169 Corridor Coalition. This is a coalition that Mayor Hovland used to be chair of, uh, and Edina used to be a member of. And so they're trying to rally support for the commission, for the uh, Highway 169 Corridor Coalition again. So the purpose of a coalition and uh, it's, it's the same as the 494 Corridor Commission, is to look at what, what can be done to make traffic flow smoothly uh, and, uh, and safely along that route, uh, as well as uh, when improvements are needed uh, to work with state representatives to understand those improvements and um, get them approved, get them funded, and, uh, and get them underway. So the interchange at Highway 169 and 494 is one example of that. So, um, but uh, they're looking for member cities. And then I inquired with the Nine Mile Creek Regional Trail when they're going to put, when they're gonna complete that section beneath 169 north of Bren, and they are going to, I'm getting new glasses, I'm not gonna have to take these on. <laughs> um, so <laughs> they are gonna break ground on that construction in the fall of 2020. They are going to construct, uh, because boardwalks have to be built in the winter. They're gonna work on it through the winter and it will be complete by the spring of 2021. So when 169 was done, they put a tunnel for the trail uh, down beneath the roadway on the ground, and, um, and it's there. It's just waiting for the trail to go through the tunnel. And the only other thing I have is to recognize the people we appointed, but maybe, Mayor, you want to do that. I see I just pulled those up, up and I Great. thought maybe I'd you do read that. those names unless you want to do that. No, you do that. I'm okay. done. Uh, Member Anderson. Thank you. Um, well, just a brief reflection and, and probably continuing an annual observation of the uh, incredible talent of the people that step forward and volunteer their time to make our city a better place to live. It's always um, a revelation, it really. The, the enthusiasm and waiting in line out to get into their interview and what is probably I think a little intimidating to walk into a room and have seven people on one side, here they are sitting down, and yet everybody handled themselves with such aplomb and such dignity. It's, 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 uh, it's very interesting and I think rewarding. Um, last night I had the opportunity to, uh, to be present when Chiefs Nelson and Schmitz uh, in, their, in the first town talk um, brought forth a lot of information to the community and I think answered a lot of questions that have been floating around in terms of staffing, uh, firehouse uh, development, um, response time. Um, and so I think that was really, really useful and that can be found, I believe, on the city website. Also, Facebook Live, if you went to the city uh, page and I, I'm assuming it's probably on YouTube as well, but there's lots of ways to check into that if you didn't have the opportunity to see it. So thank you. Thank you. I'm going to, I've got a couple of observations on it and, and a few things that have been going on schedule wise, but I want to do a just, I think we had these on the consent agenda, but I think the, these folks that are, have been selected um, 
we should be reading their names. And then there were probably 40 plus folks in our community that applied for about 19 positions. So it was, with all the talent, it's this embarrassment of riches in Edina. And we had a hard time figuring out who to appoint to what particular positions. But we got it done. And then um, tonight I've got a bundle full of thank you letters to, to sign and send out to everybody that did apply that, w that was not selected. Um, I want to make sure that uh, they know that we really appreciate them taking the time to come and, and want to serve their town. And uh, these other folks now will be embarking on, on uh, three-year careers uh, serving the city in different capacities. We had a couple of appointments to arts and culture. Uh, Rebecca Sorensen, who lives over in Morningside, and uh, Lindsay DiLorenzo, I think, lives up in Country Club. Community Health, we had uh, four appointments there. Michael Wood, Tracy Nelson, Philip King Lowe, and Andrew Hawkins. Construction Board of Appeals, Ryan Holton and Aaron Uska. And then for Energy and Environment, we had two appointments, uh, Ukasha Dakani and then Hilda Martinez it was the second uh, appointee there. Heritage Preservation had four, Mark Hasenstab, uh, Rachel Pollock, Robert Cundy, and Thomas Everson. And then for the Human Rights and Relations Commission, Fartoon Ishmael and Mark Felton. And then for Park and Rec, Matthew Doscotch, who used to be on our community health uh, committee and then moved away and came back. Planning a young woman named Kate Agnew. And then transportation, uh, uh, one of our fellow residents named Peter Lafferty. So congratulations to all of them. Uh, we've got a... Uh, uh, about a dozen uh, alternates. We always like to have somebody on the bench that uh, can step up and serve if somebody gets transferred or they, they can't attend for one reason or another. And so we're, we're poised there to appoint people to fill in gaps if we need to during the next year. Um, for me, from a schedule standpoint, we had the Regional Council of Mayors meeting on the 9th. Um, I chaired that meeting. We had Charlie Zelli, the new uh, MnDOT, or, or excuse me, MnDOT, used to be the MnDOT commissioner, the new Met Council chair there to talk about some of the things they were working on, including, I think, uh, the paramount issue that they're working on right now is light rail safety for the riders. And uh, um, coming out of private industry, working with uh, uh, the bus company Jefferson Lines, where it's, you know, in, it's always safety first when you're in the transportation business. I think it's an easy thing for him to adopt as a credo that it's going to be safety first uh, on the light rail line as well. Um, and then uh, he had a uh, walk with the mayor last Saturday. As I mentioned earlier, we had four high school students show up. Uh, one in a cast broke his collarbone playing bantam hockey and then uh, three young women uh, and their mothers came along. Uh, and we had quite a great group of folks from, I'd say, uh, 15, age 15 to uh, 86, walking around Southdale, which was, which was terrific. Um, had a TAB meeting today, and uh, a lot of good content over there. The TAB is a Transportation Advisory Board of the Met Council, and uh, I happen to chair, be on a cycle where I'm chairing that, too. That's 34 people uh, from the region a uh, slight majority of whom are uh, elected officials, either county commissioners or folks like us that are elected by their communities. And then the rest are citizen members. Some represent um, different modalities like freight, uh, um, transit, uh, pedestrian folks. And um, that group makes recommendations to the Met Council on how to spend highway trust fund monies that come down to the region, about $200 million dollars. Uh, every two years, every biennium. So uh, we're constantly working on how to r revise that, what we call the regional solicitation to make sure that there's fairness in all aspects of it, whether it's in roads and bridges category or uh, trails, uh, transit, whatever the category might be. And then last night, um, again, with some of our, our great high school students, uh, including Olivia Pierce, who did just a terrific job for those of us that attended uh, the TED Talks. Mm -hmm. In October last year, she's a 16, you know, now she's, she might be a senior this year, she was a junior last year, uh, did a terrific job on a TED Talk. Uh, we, the, the topic for Edina Reads uh, was um, Toni Morrison. It was uh, that writer's birthday, even though she's passed away now. And um, people did some readings of hers from different books that she's written. Uh, I think uh, like Beloved and some of the other jazz and some of the other books that she's done. I happen to be one of the readers too, but I, I just ended up pulling quotes and then looking at some what some other people 
said about her, including uh, James Baldwin, who was a contemporary of hers. So here's, here's a couple for, as we all leave. These are good for all of us. And this will end the meeting tonight. Some things you forget, other things you never do. Correct what you can, learn from what you can't. And for those of us that are sitting up here as elected officials serving you, as you enter positions of trust and power, dream a little before you think. So those are some, uh, some quotes from uh, Toni Morrison, who was really quite a stellar writer. And uh, I think that concludes it uh, for me. And now on to Manager Neal. Thank you, Your Honor. Just a couple of things. Um, one, uh, Councilmember Anderson referenced uh, town talks last night. Uh, that was our first uh, town talk. Uh, that we we plan to have four of these town talks this year. And the purpose of these of town talks is to try to identify some some subjects of interest, uh, debate, discussion uh, in the community, and bring the community in closer proximity to subject matter experts and and have an informative discussion uh, that involves presentation followed by question and answer, and do it in a way that um, that provides uh, you know a short commitment, right? So this was an hour long, and we kept to that hour. Uh, almost on on the on the second, um, our next one uh, is about the changing demographics in the community, and that is May twentieth at seven p.m. And we don't have a, a site yet for that, um, but I'll keep you informed about when that happens. Uh, something that I want you to th begin thinking about as as policymakers for the community is a, maybe a year or two when we adopted our cell phone tower uh, aesthetic standards. Um, we adopted them at the council by ordinance. We're now getting uh, a fair amount of pressure on, these, uh, on, on the staff side of this uh, to whether or not we would be willing to make compromises in aesthetics uh, if that would enable uh, the kind of the faster, uh, more robust rollout of 5G in the community. So it really is a question for you as elected reps is how, how, how ugly are you willing to let these things be if it produces a, a much better service uh, for, for residents in town? Member Sutton. So I, I just wanted to chime in on that. What it reminds me of is when we were revisiting our recycling policy and, and there was some discussion about should we go to once a week instead of once every other week or two cans instead of one all that kind of stuff and we did a survey I remember and we learned some really interesting things from it that were a little counterintuitive to me but it helped us I think refine that policy I wonder if something like that might be helpful I mean obviously you can't you know, a little bit of it is how ugly and exactly. how fast. <laughs> yeah. It's a, it's an but, aesthetic. But standard. I'd be interested in knowing what members of the community how what their appetite is for that 5G service. Whether that really is going to trump, you know, whether it's going to give them a more elastic yeah. feeling about the appearance. I, I mean, so, it's hard for us to know. Right, and you know, and I think both of the companies that we've dealt with recently, uh, Verizon and AT and T. Uh, want to make investment in the community to extend their networks here. In fact, Verizon has gone uh, so far as to put up a, a prop uh, of what they want to install in neighborhoods. It doesn't comply with, with our existing uh, aesthetic ordinance, but you may look at it and say, close enough. Um, if you want to see what it looks like, it's right across from the public works maintenance facility on right by the post office. Um, down there, so I would encourage you to take a look at it and see what you think. Okay. Um, we might we might come away with this and say that's fine for commercial areas, but we want to stick to our kind of our single post standard for residential areas. But I, I'd really like you to take a look at it do and they, tell me what you think. Do we have a sense of how um, how densely packed these units have to be? I mean, how far apart from one another? Five hundred feet, I think. Yeah, Mr. Milner, do you do you? Yeah, I think 500 feet is the number we keep yeah. hearing, but then every provider has their own. Right. Yeah. So then it's so you could have network. three poles and three poles, and then it could be a lot of poles out in the right of way in front of people's homes. Yeah. So that was case. one of our worries: is that because it was line of sight technology, yep. that the poles had to be at least every 500 feet, and we didn't want them to be putting a pole in front of somebody's picture window in the boulevard. Yeah. 
Well, and so. then there is some, I suppose, some sense of waiting for the technology to keep getting them smaller. Right, right. Yeah. And, and so, you know, one of the most important things that we're talking about for this is, is how, how tightly can we bind them to a commitment to taking this thing down Right, when the technology makes it this size, right? right? Um, so that's a, that's, a, that's a subject that we're struggling with right now. Um, and we're also talking about, you know, there are places they want to be uh, because they got a lot of customers. There's places we want them to be where service is poor. So there's a little bit of horse trading going on here with how, how can we bring better service to parts of town that really need it, because we need it for a public safety Right, response. there's this public safety 9-11 kind right. of work. So a lot of different uh, incentives moving every way. Uh, I also wanted to let you know about a couple of legislative uh, actions. Uh, House File 3080 and House File, Sen or excuse me, Senate File 3058. Uh, those are the bill numbers for the bonding bill uh, submission that we have for the South Metro Public Safety Training Facility. That's in line, it's moving forward. Um, it doesn't have a hearing yet, but it will. Uh, the local option sales tax bill uh, that was adopted uh, on, by the resolution by the council is also been filed. It, it doesn't have a number yet, but it should have a number by uh, the end of the week. And I'll, I'll keep you updated on that as well. And did you, we removed the transportation related or not? We haven't removed the, okay. the transportation aspects of this bill yet. Uh, that still is yet to occur. Okay. We've been told that Representative Marquardt is going to require it, but it hasn't happened yet. So right. when it does, they've told us they'll take that, that aspect out of all the different uh, municipal proposals. Because there are several. There are several. Finally, uh, just a note to, to remind you and our, and our viewers at home uh, that our next council meeting will be Wednesday. Uh, we've met on a lot of Wednesdays so far in the first quarter of, of 2020. Uh, this one is March 4th, um, 2020, to accommodate the primary on Super Tuesday the day before. And that's all I have. And unfortunately, right. the one after that is not on a Wednesday. It's on a Tuesday, I know. March 17th. Oh, so it's, it's well, that must be a really hard on you. <laughs> it's a really hard on the city manager, even. <laughs> it's a tragedy of scheduling, but <laughs> see, and also uh, coming up, we should mention to folks in the audience and also at home uh, next uh, Wednesday. Speaking of Wednesdays, next Wednesday, the 26th, is State of the Community oh, yeah. at noon with the two Rotary clubs in the chamber and open to the public yeah. at Edina Country Club. And the school's back in. That's good. Oh, good. So it's state of the community, not state of the city. Um, one other thing I was thinking about as you were talking is um, the changing landscape on technology. Uh, we're, we make a significant amount of, uh, we, we charge a significant number of amount of fee to uh, Comcast because they're in our right of way running their, their operation. I'm, I'm worried as technology goes along and things change that they're going to be back and they're going to be saying, wait a minute, you know, people are getting uh, this, a lot of programming a lot of different ways without being in the right of way and we're paying a fortune to be in the right of way. And it could be something that uh, we have to deal with downstream. I've been waiting for that for 30 years uh, and, and I think it might finally be here. So right. I, yeah, we're concerned and about that too. The other thing for Folks in the audience here remember Brindle, Brindle say she was going to um, Washington, D.C. In, in our quest to be, you know, um, the most effective sort of public servants we can be for the people in our town. People leave their jobs to go to the National League of Cities meeting. They're on the city council. And I don't, we have three or four going? Three. Three going this time. And then for me, um, I've been attending the uh, U.S. Conference of Mayors. Uh, and we're all there trying to learn best practices and, and, and sharing things that we've done here and, and, and learning things from other communities and coming back. And in fact, I'd leave tomorrow. The U.S. Conference of Mayors probably has 450 cities, over 30,000 involved in that. And there's uh, a leadership committee of about 50 mayors, and they've got a two-day meeting that I'm leaving for tomorrow because I'm involved in transportation issues and making a presentation there. Um, so we're all we're, we're all leaving uh, our, our places of employment or self-employment to try to better ourselves and be better public servants. Um, 
And so thanks for supporting that. I would say to you and everybody that's watching, thanks for supporting that um, proposition that uh, we want to do the best job we can for you. And that means doing some of these things that are important uh, in terms of broadening our horizons and our, our abilities to do the job. So that's it uh, for me. Those are the only extra things I thought of. Anybody else have anything? All right. We stand adjourned. Thank you.